Okay, good morning, everybody. It's nice to see everybody, including some familiar faces, uh, people we worked with and people we've seen before in other workshops. Um, I am going to give you an introduction to uh, the course and sort of lay some groundwork for uh, some of the concepts that we will use in the later parts of the course. Um, so some of you may be familiar with some of these things that we'll talk about, but we wanted to get through um, and make sure everybody's on the same page. So as Michelle mentioned, um, all the slides are Creative Commons. Okay, so um, just to uh, give you an introduction to why we want to do pathway network analysis and, and, and what, uh, what that means. Um, I'll, I'll just tell you a little bit more about it. So as most of you know, the main motivation is that you uh, are doing some kind of interesting experiment, usually a genomics experiment, high something high throughput, and you get a lot of, a lot of data is generated, and, uh, and then you get a huge list of genes, and then now what do you do with the, with the genes? So generally, you want to interpret the experiment, try to figure out something that is telling you, something interesting. Tell, tell me what's interesting about, about these genes. Um, and so one of the most popular, frequently, uh, and useful methods for, for looking at finding out what's interesting about genes is to compare them to known information about cellular mechanisms. So pathways, protein complexes, functions of genes, like enzymatic functions, uh, protein domains, lots of different information that we have that we know um, about how the cell works. Um, for instance, you might find that, um, that you're, you're studying cancer and the cell cycle is really strongly enriched in your, in your gene list. Um, and that's maybe not so surprising, but, but useful information. Um, okay, so why does this work? Why do we, you know, why does, why, <coughs> why are pathways um, you know, the right way of thinking about this. Maybe not the only way, but, but a useful way. Um, well, the, the, you know, the bigger picture is that, um, you know, the, the genome is uh, specifying a lot of information about how the cell works. Um, proteins are expressed and they come together and form pathways and mechanisms in the cell. Um, and so if you're studying um, genomics, uh, gene if you're studying DNA sequence type information and you're collecting mutations, um, the mutations that uh, are in the genome might affect how these systems are working. And so if you look at a list of mutations, you might see some signature um, and, and say those mutations are, are associated with a particular disease. The, that disease may um, basically be a pathway-related disease. Usually most diseases are somehow tied to a, pa a given pathway or a set of pathways. If you're studying cancer, for instance, there's, there's the famous 12 hallmark pathways of cancer, um, multiple sclerosis, and you know various other types of things are targeting the immune system. Um, and so often the mutations that you see associated with the disease that you're studying or the phenotype that you're studying are targeting the same pathway over and over again. They might touch different parts of it, but there will be a signal with, with that pathway. So knowing the pathway information really tells you, um, hopefully tells you, um, gives you some, a, a, well, finding out the pathway might tell you something very interesting. Um, also, the cell, when it's working, is generating a lot of state information. So the cell is changing state over time. Um, and uh, when we measure state information, molecular phenotypes or phenotypes um, like gene expression data, it's the level of all of the, the, the genes that are um, expressed at a given time. And you might have that information across different time points or different conditions or different disease states. And, um, and obviously, to everyone who, in, who's a biologist in the room, um, you know that these pathways will um, often be coordinately regulated. And so um, it's, it's, uh, if you see, um, so it's, it's a lot of differentially expressed genes might be related to each other and related to a particular pathway. And so if you have, there might be multiple pathways um, that you have signal for in your gene expression data. but Thinking about it from a pathway perspective really simplifies simplifies things. Um, you might also have other type of phenotype information, survival information, family phenotype information from um, you know genetics, um, and um, that information can also be incorporated um, into into this analysis. So you might be able to find links between pathways and survival, for instance. Um, 
there's also the environment. We're not really talking about that here, but obviously the environment plays a role and, and also touches pathways, and pathways react to the environment. Um, the, the information that's, that, that's coming from, from all that, so, so it's very useful to kind of just know as much information as we can about pathways in the middle here. And this information comes from many sources, um, databases, the literature, experiments, your own experiments, for instance. You might be mapping this information yourself, and you want to you want to use this information and study it. Um, so we'll talk about all of these things in the course. Okay, so pathway and network analysis, in my mind, is a very general concept uh, relating to any type of analysis that involves pathway or network information. Sometimes we call this prior information, or just knowledge about, about the system. Um, whenever we're using that knowledge about cellular mechanism, I think of it as pathway and network analysis. Um, it's ex very, very commonly applied to help interpret lists of genes, as I mentioned. The most popular type is pathway enrichment analysis, which we'll talk about this morning. Um, and in general, as I mentioned, it helps gain mechanistic insight into omics data. So that's one of the primary goals. You have a whole bunch of genomics data. You want to figure out some mechanism that is either causing or explaining the cellular state or is caused, the, the change in that mechanism is caused by changes in the genotype. Um, pathway data is also very useful for, um, for uh, improving statistical power. So um, if you're just looking at the raw data that you've produced, usually it's in the form of transcripts or SNPs or proteins. Um, and uh, so thinking about things in terms of pathways, instead of those simpler data types is uh, very useful for improving statistical power because there are fewer statistical tests that you have to consider if you're thinking about pathways. Pathways uh, collect a lot of information about transcripts, for instance, all together in one, uh, one concept. And when you do a statistical test uh, about that one concept, um, it's, bet it's better, you, you get more power than if you do a statistical test for the hundreds of transcripts that might be part of that pathway because of multiple testing correction, which we'll talk about this morning as well. Um, generally, pathway analysis is more reproducible. There's a famous, um, uh, st lots of famous stories about how people have looked at for gene expression signatures that predict the outcome of breast cancer. That was one of the first, first uh, diseases that was studied with gene expression signatures. And, um, and what people found is even if they were studying the same types of breast cancer, they found that the gene expression signatures that they derived were different and didn't, basically didn't overlap in terms of genes. But when people looked at the pathway level, often it was the same pathways that were being affected. Um, and so then you can make relation, you can find relationships and similarities across data sets. Uh, it's also easier to interpret because it's, it's in the form of fami familiar concepts like the cell cycle, apoptosis. And as I mentioned, very importantly, it can help explain mechanism. So it can help get into the cause of why you're seeing gene expression changing or why all these mutations are targeting this set of genes. Um, that could really um, uh, help you um, in, uh, in, in uh, understanding your system. And uh, we'll see a number of examples of this, and we'll really get into some of the details of, of this in the, in the course. Um, the, um, and, and I like to kind of talk now more about um, how pathway information is um, helping us define the causes or getting a more causal understanding of, of the system versus when, if you didn't have pathways, you're limited to a correlation type of analysis. So genome-wide association analysis associates a mutation with a phenotype, but that doesn't say that mutation causes the phenotype. However, if you're able to say that there's a, this mutation is affecting a pathway and that pathway is clearly related to the phenotype that you're studying, um, then, then that's potentially giving you some information about the cause and it can really help you narrow down to, to useful things to follow up on. Same thing with, with, with gene expression data. The pathway explains the gene expression signal and if we get a very simple explanation of that gene expression signal, we can um, basically have an understanding of what's happening in our, in our system. Um, so, um, just to uh, continue along the track of explaining pathway analysis in different steps, um, the first thing that we assume everybody has done coming into this course is that they know how to normalize their data. We're not going to talk about uh, normalization in the course, but if you have questions about it, many of the instructors and TAs can help you um, answer questions. Um, but 
Generally, each data type that you're working with has its own uh, standard. If it's very well established, it has a standard workflow for normalizing data like microarrays or RNA-seq. RNA-seq, the newer the data, the, the less standard it is. It takes a certain amount of years before normalization techniques are very standardized. But in general, where you get the data from, uh, the people that you get the data from, often people get their data from a core facility these days. Um, those are the best people to talk to about what the state of the art is for standardization and normalization. Um, and um, the output of that is normalized results, which we can convert into a gene list, and that's what we expect to start with here. Um, and there's other workshops that talk about the statistics of, of the normalization, um, but just to let you know that that's kind of a, a background. So here's, here's the workflow that we're thinking about um, for pathway analysis that's very general um, to all pathway analysis pretty much. So uh, we're collecting genomics data like mRNA expression. Uh, we, as I mentioned, normalize and score. Um, so scoring might involve computing the differential expression. So we, we, we ask which genes are different, differentially expressed between normal and disease state um, or phenotype of interest. Uh, we generate a gene list. This might be the top most, you know, this might be, um, you know, all the genes in your list that are scored and ranked according to differential expression. Or if you have a lot of samples, you might be clustering your data and you might find that there's a certain number of clusters of genes that act similarly. And so each one of those clusters defines a list of genes that you could analyze and figure out what pathways are um, enriched in that list. And generally, after that, you want to learn about underlying cellular mechanism using pathway network analysis. So that involves visualizing and identifying interesting pathways and networks, um, often drilling down to understand more about the molecular mechanism, and then un developing some model that ideally you publish. So the um, interesting, this is where we really spend most of our time in visualizing and identifying interesting pathways and networks. What interesting is and how you find what's interesting is, to, you know, dependent. There's a, a number of ways of doing that that we'll, we'll talk about. Um, and we'll also talk about drilling down to understand more details about molecular mechanism. Um, so just to give you an, an example of, um, of uh, a, a pathway analysis study that, was, that we were involved in that um, ended up being a very good example of how statistical power was in, increased in the um, analysis. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about a uh, paper that we published, w that was published a few years ago now, uh, led by Stephen Scherer, who's a, um, a geneticist, uh, human geneticist in the University of Toronto at SickKids Hospital, who mostly studies autism spectrum disorder. Um, and at the time, um, and, and so when I, when I got involved in this project, I was surprised to learn how heritable this syndrome is, and for people that don't know, this is the, a syndrome that affects um, usually appears in childhood and um, is a, a, a problem with social interaction and some other um, aspects of, of uh, there's other aspects of the phenotype. But I was um, very interested to see that, that it's, it's actually highly heritable. I didn't realize how much heritability there is in this disease. Um, the twin concordance is up to 90%, although there's a spectrum of, of phenotypes, so you might have one twin with very mild or almost non-existent di disease and, or disorder and some one twin with very um, uh, severe disorder. So people had previously studied this disease and found a number of rare single gene mutations that were correlated that were thought to be involved in autism spectrum disorder. But more recently at the time, people had noticed that a lot of uh, copy number variants, including rare de novo copy number variants, were important. And so they wanted to study this further. So they collected uh, approximately 1,000 cases and controls um, and used a SNP array to identify copy number variants. So the copy number variants are identified by, from SNP arrays by looking at um, uh, a region of the, a, a series of SNPs that form a, a, a genomic region that are all um, uh, the SNP array measures the level of DNA in the sample, so you can uh, see if there's a deletion. There's no DNA measured for a whole track of the whole length of, of SNPs that form a region, and so you call that a deletion. Um, and similarly for a, a gain or amplification. Um, they uh, filtered out large chromosomal rearrangements and anything common, focused on these high-quality, rare copy number variants that they thought were de novo. Um, and um, and they looked at, uh, to see which genes were affected by these copy number variants were associated with 
autism spectrum disorder. And they found a few, but very few. And the reason for this is they had so many thousands of, of copy number variants and, and SNPs that they could look at that um, they, they lost a lot of statistical power in their multiple testing correction, which we'll talk about. So we looked at, at things from a pathway perspective. This was work done by Daniela Americo, who was um, in my lab at the time um, and um, now works in SickKids and Steve Scherer's group, um, that uh, we, we tried to find, instead of looking at genes associated with, with this autism spectrum disorder, we looked at pathways associated with autism spectrum disorder. So instead of looking at thousands and thousands of genes, we're looking at, or say tens of thousands of genes, we're looking at um, hundreds to thousands of pathways. Uh, and um, um, we found a, a very strong signal of lots of different pathways that were associated. Uh, and interestingly, when we looked at some of these, these pathways, we realized that um, there were, the genes that were in the pathways were not mutated often in the out of a thousand uh, they did, they weren't mutated at a high frequency in our in our cases um, but the pathway was mutated at a high frequency so there were different genes in the pathway mutated differently in every person so you could never tell that by looking at individual genes that there was a signal because you only found one person out of a thousand that was mutated so there's no way you could distinguish that from background but when you collected them all into a pathway we found that there might be 10 or 20 patients out of 1,000 that were mutated, had that pathway affected by, by deletions. And so that illustrates how uh, thinking about things, with integrating pathway information can incre increase your statistical power. And in this case, especially because the mutations were very rare and there was no way you could really distinguish them from, from background. Um, a lot of these uh, pathways were involved in, in functions that made sense. Um, like central nervous system development, uh, and um, and so that also um, helps verify that the experiment's even wor even working. You're getting interesting biological signals from it. Okay, um, I might have time uh, later to tell you about another really interesting story that was more recently published uh, that that goes more into mechanism and and actually translation. Um, if I have time, I I will go into it. Um, the um, okay, so so. Gene lists come from a range of places, um, and depending on uh, where your gene list comes from, there might be different types of analyses that you that you might do. Um, so molecular profiling, looking at mRNA or transcript uh, um, or protein expression. Um, some people may have seen a couple, like I guess it was last week, two papers in Nature publishing the protein expression atlas across dozens and dozens of human tissues. Um, so this is actually getting to be more, protein expression measurements are getting to be more mainstream. Um, this allows you to uh, identify transcripts and genes, or transcripts and proteins that are relevant to your experiment. Uh, so you'll get a gene list out of that. Um, you also quant can quantify the information. Um, so you might not just look at whether it's there or not, but actually measure the, the, the level of it. And, um, and that gives you a gene list plus some values. And those values can be useful in pathway analysis for specific types of pathway analysis. Um, so mostly you'd want to rank and cluster your data, as I mentioned before. Um, uh, if, you, if you just have a gene list, if, if, you, if you have a gene list that is just identified, the genes present or absent, um, there's t uh, that's actually very clean because you have a, a gene list that's well-defined and you can go and do your pathway analysis on that gene list. If you have a, a list of genes that are ranked by um, differential expression, some score that you have, um, then that becomes a little bit more, uh, there's a couple of additional steps that are required. For instance, you need to think about this ranking. Are you going to take the top set of genes and, and um, the most differentially expressed genes and, and analyze those? Um, or what are you, how are you going to set that cutoff? And actually, what we prefer to do is not set a cutoff and use all of the genes that are in the list and um, because setting that cutoff is usually very arbitrary. You don't usually have a good scientific rationale for choosing, you know, 0.5 or 1.0 or whatever value you're going to use for your threshold. So it's better if you can use statistics that consider everything, all the information, and those statistics are available and wide, widely used, uh, and we'll ta teach you about those. Um, another way of getting gene lists is by clustering, as I mentioned. So um, we're not going to talk about it in too much detail, but um, many people uh, who have lots of data uh, cluster the data, it's unsupervised clustering, to find groups of genes uh, that 
act similarly across your samples, and that defines a straightforward gene list. People also do um, protein interaction measurements. Uh, they identify microRNAs, uh, transcription factor binding sites. Increasingly, technology is available to do these, like chromatin IP, followed by DNA sequencing. Did you have a question? Yeah? Um, no, I think the, it's best to work with the quantification data if you have it. It's just that sometimes you don't have that information. So, um, for instance, if you are clustering your data, even if you have, um, uh, even if you have, well, I guess a better example is um, uh, chromatin IP. So you have, you, you have a transcription factor and you want to see where it binds in the genome, and you measure all of the binding locations. That's, that's it. You have the binding locations. You link them to genes. And you have a list, so you don't have a nat you don't na have a, any kind of natural score. There might be some score that's related to confidence in there, but um, you know, assuming that you're making good confidence calls, which are much easier to make with a scientific rationale, you 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 use statistics to say these these results are confident, and I'm going to go forward with these. Um, once you do that, you have a list. Um, does that make sense? Right. Um, yeah. So there. So the question is: the question is, um, if you have quantif if you have quanti uh, quantitative data like gene expression measurements, um, and you want to use a tool that doesn't use it, is that useful? Yes, it can still be useful. Um, generally, we try to go through workflows and tools in this course that are um, that try to make use of all the data that you have, um, but. You might come across a tool that doesn't take that doesn't consider the uh, the data all the data that you have. It might still be very useful for you to use that tool, and often you get similar results. Um, generally, when you use the quantification information, you'll get better results, more sensitive. Um, you might get more information coming out of it. But sometimes, um, you know, just taking the top 100 genes that are differentially expressed and putting them into a simple pathway analysis method, you'll you you might get some strong signal there that will be the same as um, as the method that's more advanced, the method that's more advanced is likely more sensitive and gives you more information. So if you're going to do pathway analysis and you have a choice, you should use the method that will recommend methods that are useful, uh, that are appropriate. But if you just want to try out different tools, there's no reason why not throw the data in and see what happens. Um, does that make sense? But then you have to think about the cutoff. And if you're going to publish that, then you have to argue that somehow. Um, which is increasingly, I mean, still works fine, but over time that'll be increasingly difficult because more and more people recognize that, you know, you, you, you know why aren't you looking at a thousand genes, not a hundred genes? You might have some natural way of doing it that, that works. Any other questions? Feel free to interrupt with questions. Um, okay, so genetic screens, um, you might be working with a model organism where you're looking at... Uh, um, perturbations of genes with microRNAs or uh, um, gene knockouts, um, and uh, um, um, you might have those linked to phenotype. So you might be doing a, a, a screen to see which genes are involved in a phenotype, and that defines a list of genes. Association studies, as I mentioned, uh, genome-wide association studies that link genetic markers with a phenotype, that associate genetic markers with a phenotype, generate a list of genes. Um, any um, anyone here who's working on, uh, who has gene lists that aren't covered by these these points? These cover most of most things that people do, but sometimes there's. Okay. Right. But then you still relate those to genes somehow. So for ideally, and we'll we'll go over a, a method that's useful for for methylation, um, but uh, called GREAT. So you'll you'll see that later. I think it's in the assignment, right? Yeah. So um, the um, but that's a good point. So you need to, which I didn't make explicit here, but pathway analysis depends on a gene list, right? So somehow you need to get from your 
raw data to a gene list. Um, so if you have, meth and depending on the type of data you have, that might be easy or complicated. So you might get a direct readout of genes, like in gene expression analysis, or if you're doing methylation um, mapping, then you have these regions of the genome, or copy number variants is the same thing. Um, how do you relate those to genes? So in CPG island methylation, you have a, there, there's usually an idea that um, you have, uh, you know, if the promoter region is highly methylated, then it's going to be silencing the gene that's downstream, and so that's how you might relate it. But there's probably a lot of methylation that's not explained by that and not covered. Um, and that's actually a good point to mention that pathway analysis, um, also because we're working with genes, you know, on the positive side, we get all this useful mechanistic information. On the negative side, we don't know everything about all the pathways for, all, you know, what, we don't know the function of all genes. In fact, half the, of most genomes that are studied, don't, we don't have a very good function for. Um, we'll talk about later in the class um, on, um, I guess, Friday, how to think about gene function prediction. But, um, but uh, pathway analysis only works with the genes that we have pathway information for. So you, in your, you should always um, be aware that you might have very strong signals coming from genes with no known function. Those should be followed up because um, they might be very important for your particular study. Yep. Uh, they might not, yeah. So um, then, um, and that's that's actually an interesting point for uh, later. You'll see in the pathway enrichment analysis uh, lectures that um, the most pathway enrichment analysis tools don't consider the difference between an activator and a repressor. Um, and so you might find your you know activators and repressors are in different parts of your gene list. So one way to address that is to not consider the sign of change. You just you just consider the, the, the change, whether it's changing or not. Um, but, but that's an interesting point that is not uh, generally considered very much by pathway, and pathway analyses. So um, we might have a chance on Friday to talk about the future of pathway analysis. It's still an active area of research that the goal of that research is to integrate as much of this knowledge as we can. You'll see some of the methods are very simple, um, but that's not, that doesn't mean they're not useful. They're, they're, they're still quite useful. Ideally, we would incorporate more and more of this information over time. Um, I, I, I also um, keep on using gene expression as an, ex as an example. That's just a convenient example, but feel free to ask questions about any, any um, other type of analysis or data, sorry, any other type of data that you have. Um, and we'll, we'll use different types of data in the course. Um, okay, so biological um, uh, gene lists, because they come from different places and you, they, they might mean different things. So if I'm looking at gene expression, differential gene expression, it's probably the gene list that I get out of that are very much related to pathways. Um, however, if I'm doing um, a uh, mass spec experiment to identify everything that's in the nucleolus, now my, you know, there's going to be pathways that are in the nucleolus, but my gene list is really related to the location of what part of the cell I'm studying. Um, also, we have chromosomal location, which I, I, I just talked about, where we have, um, you know, could add methylation to this list. Um, you have a list of genes that might be all the genes that are in a region of the chromosome. So it is important to just understand um, what that means because the different, just think about it, if, obviously I think that's obvious to most people, but um, there might be different choices that you make with pathway analysis depending on, on this. And so um, the questions that you uh, the question that you want to answer is uh, important. Um, so some of the standard typical questions that people ask um, when they're doing genomics experiments is, you know, what biological processes or other aspects of gene function are enriched in the, in the gene list? So that's one question that we'll answer with pathway enrichment analysis. Um, what pathways are different between samples? So you might have two different samples and you, you, that you uh, have some idea that they're different. Um, but you might not really know how different they are. 
But if you see that there's very different pathways active in two different samples that could help tell you that they're different. Um, you could be interested in finding a controller or a master regulator. Um, so we will review all of these, all these points. Um, you might be uh, wanting to discover new pathways or new members of pathways. Um, discover new gene function. So you might find that there is a gene that's really important, really associated. You get a really strong signal. We know nothing about it um, in the typical databases, and you might want to learn about that. So we'll talk about that. Um, and, uh, or you might want to correlate pathways with disease or some phenotype. Um, so um, we will talk in this workshop about regula regulatory network analysis to find controllers, pathway enrichment analysis to summarize and compare, um, and network analysis to predict gene function, find new pathway members, and identify functional modules, which might be new pathways. OK, so getting going into a little bit more um, Again, background information, but more details into pathway enrichment and enrichment analysis. Um, one of the standard methods that Quaid will be talking about later this afternoon, this this morning, is um, pathway enrichment analysis, where we have our gene list and we have a, a whole set of pathways, and we basically ask, are there any pathways that are enriched in my gene list? So I have a, a thousand genes, and half of them are related to a particular pathway. And, um, but that's much more than I expect if I look at the whole genome where only 5% of genes are related to a particular pathway. So 50% versus 5% is a big enrichment. Um, so basically to do this analysis, and this is a, uh, the simplest type of pathway analysis, um, and so it, it, but, it, but it, a lot of pathway analysis are, are, have the same parts. They have your gene list as input that you define, so we talked about that. Uh, and you have your pathway databases, um, which um, could also be enriched by other types of gene function, not just biological processes. Um, so I talked about, um, uh, so we'll, I'll, I'll just go over some basics of working with gene lists, and then um, some information about useful sources of pathway information, and more of that will be discussed later on in the course. Okay, so um, people... Some people might uh, be very knowledgeable about this if they've been working with their gene lists a lot. Um, but one of the, uh, just some important uh, uh, concepts from the informatics of working with gene lists is that you have to obviously figure out what your gene is. And usually there's a name or a number associated with that gene. Um, and these names or numbers are called identifiers. Um, for them to be useful, they need to be unique and stable. Um, and um, usually they're keeping track of these genes in databases. Um, so Entree Gene is uh, from the NCBI, records gene identifiers as numbers. Um, and uh, the problem with this is that, so that's great. The problem with it is that there are thousands of databases that store information, and often they'll have their own numbers that they assign. So you have one gene, it might have thousands of numbers associated with it or names. Um, um, there's also record uh, databases for genes, DNA, RNA, and protein that are different. So even though you're thinking about genes and you're thinking, okay, it doesn't matter if I'm thinking about gene or DNA or RNA or protein that comes from that gene, it's all the same concept to me right now for pathway analysis. But there will be different um, identifiers, and there's you know you need to think uh, understand the correct type. So a gene symbol. The name of a gene is really about the gene. It's not about the DNA location of the protein because there are multiple proteins that come from that gene, multiple tran transcripts. Um, so you can't have a unique identifier for a gene symbol if there's multiple things coming out of it. So um, uh, gene databases don't store the sequence. They just link to the sequence. They store the concept of a gene. Um, so, so that's just an important concept to, to know. Um, NCBI has... Uh, dozens of databases that are really interlinked a lot be with by these identifiers. These identifiers are referencing uh, different databases. Um, just for your information, uh, here's some, an example of a lot of different identifiers. The um, ones that are underlined in, in, and, and uh, highlighted in red are we are recommending for general use. Um, uh, because they're, they're generally widely recognized by tools. Um, in particular, Entree gene IDs are, are quite useful, and gene symbols. Um, but gene symbols are specific for specific organisms, whereas Entree gene is general for everybody. Um, and uh, this, these blue numbers illustrate the variety of identifiers you can see, and also the potential for confusion. You might have an Entree gene ID 
and an RGD, rat, the rat genome database, they both use numbers. So if you got a bunch of, if I give you a bunch of numbers, you won't be able to tell what identifier it is. Um, so um, that's confusing. Um, the um, and so you just really have to be careful about remembering what ID you're using, what ID type. Sometimes that's a problem if you have these big spreadsheets that you get from someone with lots of columns and lots of different IDs. Maybe those IDs aren't even listed in that spreadsheet, so it's good to keep track of them, the, the types. Um, okay, so there's tons of identifiers. Um, most software tools and pathway analysis only recognize a handful of these types. Uh, and so usually if you have some specialized type of identifier that usually comes from a, a platform, an experimental platform that you're using, this was more of an issue with microarrays. So gene expression microarrays have, each company has their own set of names for all the probes on the microarrays, and you have to convert those to uh, gene names that are, use, that are, it take, that are recognized by, by pathway tools. And so there are online tools for converting those things. Um, you might also have uh, an, a gene exp um, identifier type that's not recognized by a pathway tool, even though it's a standard type, and so you need to convert. So converting, um, con doing these conversions, these identifier translation is one kind of main, main thing that you might need to do. Um, and um, obviously these are also useful for searching for your favorite gene. If you don't have the if, you, if, you're data, if you're searching a database that doesn't recognize your ID identifier, you won't find any results. But that not, might not mean that that gene is not there. It might just mean that you have the wrong name for it. Um, so just to, you know, you probably, most people probably know this, but just to try different, if you have a, a set of genes, if you don't find a gene in some resource, but you expect to find it, maybe you're, you're not using the right type. Um, gene identifiers are used for linking. So if you go to a website, often there'll be links to to other websites, and usually they use these identifiers, um, and merging from different data sources. So if you have um, uh, multiple data types that you're combining, um, ideally you have them all with the same identifier and you can e easily merge them, but if you don't, you'll have to convert them to, to entree gene IDs, for instance. Okay, so some of the challenges of working with identifiers are um, avoiding, basically avoiding errors. So it's if you're working with a, s a few genes, it's not really a problem. You can always detect if something went wrong. But if you have a list of 20,000 genes and you're just copying and pasting them into spreadsheets, um, there might be some big problems that are happening that you don't see. Um, so that's why we recommend using stable, unique identifiers because if you use, um, and, and gene symbols are count as that, but gene names don't, and protein names. So pr there are a lot of names for genes and proteins that are not standardized but they're used in the literature. So in cancer, people say P53, but the gene symbol is TP53. It's pretty similar, but sometimes you actually get very different names, like LFS1 that's used in a paper. And what is that? Well, if you type LFS1 into a, a, gene, a pathway analysis tool, it might recognize it as a different gene, um, not P53, even though that's what you meant. So it's always better to use these standard gene symbols for that reason. Um, People also may have noticed that um, Excel can introduce errors. Excel is very commonly used in, in, in biology. Um, and if you're, especially if you're pasting a lot of genes, um, some gene names are recognized as dates. How many people have seen this? OK, so quite a few. So um, the, um, you know, if you, OCT4 is an important transcription factor. If you, if you paste that into Excel, just by loading up Excel and pasting it, it will think it's October 4th. So that's not good. Um, and there's dozens of genes like this. So whenever you're pasting to Excel, you should paste as text. Use paste special and say as text, not general, because general, it tries to be smart, and it's not smart for biology. So there, there are also um, sometimes problems reaching 100% um, coverage. Um, so you might have 1,000 genes that you're interested in working with, and um, you want to convert them to, you, you, they're using Affymetrix gene IDs, and you want to convert them to gene entree gene IDs. But you might only get 950 of them converting, um, and 50 of them are missing. So um, in that case, there's, there's reasons for that. Usually it's a version issue. You might be using it, like there might be out of date data in one place, and then that doesn't map correctly uh, for the reasons I mentioned before. Um, so in that case, what you can do is you can take your 950 that worked, set them aside, take the 50 that didn't work, and try different resources, try different ways of converting those, those 
trying to convert them to another identifier and then, um, and then back to entree gene IDs. Or worse comes to worse in the end, if it's important for you, you can manually go search them in entree gene and then you'll have a full, a complete list. But that's something that happens fairly frequently. It's a paper that talks about um, all of these things about problems with using Excel. It's kind of interesting. Um, and also, um, some high-profile papers, like this paper from Nature from ten, over 10 years ago now, um, was re this paper was retracted because of a gene identifier problem. So they had a paper that, um, um, so it says um, that they were interested in a microRNA target um, that they uh, looked at that was homolog of ES1, HES1, um, but they actually looked at the transcriptional repressor Harry enhancer of split, also called HES1. So because they searched HES1 and it's not, it wasn't a, a unique ID, they actually made a mistake and um, the whole paper was based on this, so it had to be retracted. Um, and, oops, what did I do here? Um, and uh, so just a, a good example of not what not to do. Um, so the ID mapping service that we'll be talking about is gconvert. Um, this is uh, based on, um, uh, it supports a lot of different organisms. Um, I noticed a couple of people in the audience are working with prokaryotic systems, so we'll, this, this doesn't, I think, deal with prokaryotic systems, so we'll, talk, we'll have to look at, at that. Um, but, you know, the basic idea is that you type in a set of genes from, um, you know, say, gene names, uh, gene symbols, and you can convert them to entree gene IDs. And we'll look at this in the, in the assignment, and there's an optional lab. We're not going to go through a lab on that. Um, so general recommendations um, for protein and genes um, is to map everything to entree gene IDs or official gene symbols using a spreadsheet. Um, I talked about getting 100% coverage. Be careful of the Excel auto conversions, um, especially when working with large gene lists, and, um, and that just generally make your life easier. Um, just to note that uh, most, again, we're talking about genes. Genes encode transcripts and splice variants and, and multiple forms of that gene. Um, sometimes those forms are very different in function from each other. However, in general, at this point in time, we don't have a lot of information about transcripts and splice variants. Um, you might have a lot of information from your particular area of study. Um, so you might be able to use that information, but generally the pathway analysis methods just consider genes and they'll lump all the transcripts together. Um, and it's it, the reason for that is that the pathway information is not generally available at the resolution of splice variants. Yep? Yeah? Right, so that's a good question. The question is, what do you do if you have all of your gene symbols, and you have a nice list of gene symbols, and you put them into a software tool, it doesn't recognize them. So usually the reason for that is the version problem. So maybe that software tool is using a different, well, usually it's a different version of the database than you use, and databases are getting updated all the time, so there's a chance for that. Um, the uh, one thing that you can do is you can convert those gene symbols to a gene symbol type that is um, if you look in the pathway tool, they might have a primary type that they've used. For instance, some databases are based on ensemble, and, um, and ensemble, um, they might be better at, at recognizing ensemble identifiers. Generally, entree gene IDs are, are pretty good, but um, uh, that's always going to be a problem. Um, if you really want to get full coverage, then you have to investigate a little bit more and maybe try different, um, different uh, translations. Probably the practical thing to do would either be reading about the resource to see what ID is maybe recommended by them, um, but often people don't recommend an identifier. So then you, you, you could just try a few different common identifiers, like try mapping to entree gene ID, ensemble ID, RefSeq, or Unipro. Maybe those are working better. Um, but yeah, so it's always a problem, and sometimes you just can't solve that problem unless you were the person who's developing the tool and you update their database, which is not possible for most users. So, yeah? 
try to uh, consider aggregate gene as a big probability to different proteins. But I think it's a big problem with the shape of the vascular analysis to compare protein interaction with gene mix. So generally, um, I should have specified even more that the pathway, so the question is, you know, what if your, pro your gene is not a protein coding gene, I think, um, and, and how do you deal with that? Right. Right, right. So um, there's, two quest there's two questions there, really. So one is, um, uh, you know, protein coding genes, and I should have even specified further that the genes that are generally considered by pathway and network analysis tools are only protein coding genes. There's a lot of other genes being described now. MicroRNAs sometimes are included in pathways, but generally not at this point, but that'll come over time. There's link RNAs, there's thousands of them, right? There's, there's all sorts of genes that are expressed. Some of them we, you know, we don't even know that type of gene, what it does. But, um, and so the, in general, the, the more well-studied a gene is, the more likely it will be to be incorporated in pathway analysis in general. So over time, as microRNAs are better studied, they'll be more and more incorporated. Um, the other question was more about context so of your experiment. So if you have a, a gene that is maybe expressed but never converted, never translated to a protein, um, but you're linking it to protein interactions, that doesn't make sense biologically because that protein will never be expressed and now you're considering it in a protein complex, right? We can't really, um, uh, the pathway databases don't really try to incorporate any context. So they don't know about that context. They just try to get all the information they can of anything that could happen um, in the cell. And generally, your experimental method, say it's gene or protein expression, will help provide that context. So um, if you have that information, you know that the protein won't be expressed, then you can use it. Otherwise, whenever you're working with transcripts, you're left with that open question of how it gets converted to a protein. Um, because it, it, we know that, in general, mRNA level is, is uh, correlated with protein level. But any individual case could be completely opposite. You could have high gene expression, high MR, like transcript level, and no protein, or the or vice versa, right? Because of many many factors. So, for any given microarray, well, in general, people have looked at this. People have studied mRNA expression versus protein expression, and they find yes, it's correlated. But you know, if there's no mRNA, there's no often there's no protein, stuff like that. But that correlation is not great, and so it's, it's um, and then, so there's lots of problems with it. And, and any particular experiment will be very different. So that's another, another um, I think I, I will mention it. If you have the data, that's why protein expression data would be great if we could have it, right? Like if you could do, you could get protein expression data, then you could really get at that. But since we don't have it. We're limited to transcript levels because it's easy to measure. So it's not what we want to measure. It's what's easy to measure in that case. And so um, it's a problem in, in genomics in general is what species are we, me what, you know, chemical species are we measuring? So it's, it's a very good question because, and I'll, I'll mention it actually tomorrow afternoon, I think, in terms of the pathway network databases, what they don't cover. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit. Yeah? So the question is, if you have a genomic region in general or, you know, points on the genome, how do you convert that to genes? We don't really talk about it too much. We, we are going to mention a tool called GREAT that is useful for pathway analysis of regions. And GREAT has a lot of options for how to convert those regions to genes. 
Um, and so when you when we got, and I think it's in the in the integrator assignment, right? So as I mentioned before, um, when we get to that point in the assignment, you can see how they're doing it. But there, I, I agree, there's no standard, and it's a problem. Um, and so um, there's, uh, you know, most people will choose some reasonable way of doing it, <coughs> but that's probably missing a lot of important information. So again, part of the reason for that is we don't exactly know how SNPs relate to genes. Clearly, if it's in the coding region, it's easy. So that's clear. Everybody will include that. But if, you know, there's the, the other extreme is an enhancer region 100 KB away from your gene, and then you know, it's, it's, it's not. Yeah, it's, we just don't know about that. So is there another question? OK. I should move on, because we have actually another section here um, about the pathway. So we talked about the gene list. Um, and now we're going to talk briefly about the pathways. We'll come back to this a few in a few places in the in the course. Um, but just to give you some background about um, a couple of sources of gene pathways and other gene function attributes. In general, there's a lot of information in databases. Um, pathways come from pathway databases like Reactome that, that Robin works at, and um, we'll, we'll talk about, and also the gene ontology. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention what the gene ontology is. So there's, there's lots of other types of annotations, chromosome position, disease association, um, interactions with other genes, and those are, we'll consider those later. Um, so gene ontology, how many people know about the gene ontology? Okay, so about a third to a half of people. Um, gene ontology, so I'll just go over it. Uh, gene ontology is a dictionary of biological terms or uh, phrases which are applied to genes, like protein kinase, apoptosis, membrane, all sorts of attributes of gene, of gene function. Um, it's a dictionary because each of these terms has a definition. And it's also an ontology, which is a formal system for describing knowledge because there's relationships between the terms. So there's a structure, a hierarchical structure, where more general terms are at the top of the hierarchy and more specific terms are at the bottom. Um, and the, the relationships include things like is a and part of. So you might have the nuclea, nucleolus as part of the nucleus, as part of the cell, uh, or you might say that um, you know protein kinase is a type of kinase, and apoptosis is a type of cell death. Um, so multiple levels of gene of detail of gene function are described, um, and you can have an individual term that has multiple parents. Um, and so when you have a, a gene that's associated to um, to, to gene ontology. To any term, it's actually in, you infer that it's also associated to all the parent terms in the hierarchy. Gene ontology covers three aspects of function: where, a, where cellular component, where the gene is expressed; molecular function, what the gene does on a molecular level, like enzymatic function; and biological process, which is the pathway that the gene's part of, or the global process. And that's usually what we're most interested in for pathway analysis: is the biological process side. Um, so there's two parts of gene ontology. There's terms and annotation. So terms I've been talking about, uh, they are added by editors at, at database groups and by requests from users. Um, experts help with developing this gene ontology. And um, as of a couple of years ago, um, there are, were you know, almost 40,000 terms with definitions. So there's lots of, it's a big dictionary. Um, most of them are biological process terms. Uh, the second part is annotations. This is where uh, gene terms are linked to genes. So I have a gene. I want to say that it's, it's um, um, part of um, you know, cell division, and it's glucose 6-phosphate isomerase activity, and it's in, the, you know, it's, in, it's in the cytoplasm or something. So I will take my gene and link it to those terms in gene ontology. Um, and when I do that, that there's some information associated with that, which is um, uh, the evidence that I use to, to do that, maybe a PubMed ID, uh, different types of evidence. There's actually a bunch of little parts that go with the evidence of de describing that. Um, uh, these are known as annotations or gene associations. Or, um, and in general, often there's multiple annotations per gene. Um, sometimes th this can be problematic um, because it's... it's uh, difficult to, to, to work with multiple multiple functions per gene. Um, some gene ontology annotations are created automatically without human review. So it's very important to just know that. Um, in general, there's a lot of annotations that are manually 
curated by scientists, which are high quality. Um, they're time consuming, so there, there's not that many of them compared to the rest. Uh, there's a lot of terms that are, that are reviewed computational analysis. So sometimes computational analysis um, can be very good at predicting the function of a gene, and people will review the results to make sure it's not broken. Um, so for instance, if a gene, if a protein has a, a transmembrane region, um, it's very likely to be a membrane protein, and 99% accuracy at doing that, at, at finding those transmembrane locations. So that's purely predicted, and but very high accuracy. Um, there's also a section that's called electronic annotation that's not reviewed. It's, it's annotation derived without any supervision, basically. Computational predictions that have varying accuracy, and in general is considered lower quality than the manual codes. So it's important to understand this and be aware of the origin of the data. In general, the practical aspects of this are that when you um, do your genelist analysis, you might want to start by excluding the um, in the the uh, electronic annotation, um, the um, we will talk about that. The code evidence code is IEA, um, inferred from electronic annotation here. So there's actually a lot of different evidence types. Um, IEA is all the the lower, I, maybe lower quality ones. Um, and so often what we do is we'll we might start with just the um, the manual ones. If we don't get a lot of good information coming out, then we could extend our search to include these electronic annotation ones, which you're kind of forced to use if you don't have um, good analysis coming out, or if you just want to be more, exp have to spend more time exploring into more un potentially unknown space, you could, you could use those. Um, different, depending on what organism you're studying, there's different coverage of uh, gene ontology annotations. Um, all major model organisms are well, well co covered in human. Uh, a number of bacterial and parasite species. Um, uh, the current list is, is on the web, um, so you could look at it. Um, but there is variable coverage. So Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeast is, uh, every gene has been looked at to see whether it could be assigned a go term or not. And they keep that up to date. Whereas um, you know, some of these other things will only have electronic annotation. And so that's a case where you're forced to use an electronic annotation because there, there are no annotations uh, that are manually curated for that organism. So interesting to know. Um, there's a lot of contributing databases, which I won't go over. Uh, one um, useful uh, concept in gene ontology is uh, what's called a slim ontology. So Gene ontology has all these tens of thousands of terms, um, and sometimes that's too many terms for certain uses. So sometimes people put a pie chart in their in their um, in their as a figure in their paper to summarize, you know, in this case, the locations of all the genes, uh, the express locations of all the genes or proteins. Um, but uh, if you had thousands of terms, you'd have thousands of pie slices and it just wouldn't work as a visualization. So um, the Go Slim set has been created to map a lot of specific terms to more general, to a, f a smaller set of specific, of general terms. Um, and sometimes you can map those to, you might see these in pathway tools where they're using slim versions of, of gene ontology. Um, there's some generic ones and also ones available for certain species. Um, okay. So um, Go resources are freely available to anyone without restriction. In general, everything that we've chosen for this course is like that. Uh, it includes the ontologies, the associations, and tools developed by Go. There's lots of tools that use gene ontology. In fact, almost all pathway analysis tools um, or pathway enrichment tools are generally using gene ontology. So um, that's why we go over it. Um, you can look up gene ontology terms on QuickGo. So that's the, uh, a site that I recommend. Oops. Um, for um, looking up Go terms. And um, there are lots of other ontologies, but generally they're not used, found in pathway analysis tools, but just so you know that gene ontology is not the only one. Um, okay, so, so gene ontology, we talked about it. It's a very good source of information about uh, pathways that your genes are involved in. There's also lots of pathway databases. And I'm not going to go into too much detail here because we'll cover them in more detail later in the course. But um, we, we maintain a website called pathguide.org that tries to collect links to all of the pathway databases that exist. And we just updated it last year. And there were 550 databases that have some information about pathways or cellular mechanisms, whatever that might be. 
is actually a broad range of types of information, protein interactions, signaling pathways, metabolic pathways, transgene regulatory networks, uh, small molecule interactions, whether those small molecules are metabolites or drugs, tons of information about cellular mechanism. Um, and that, unfortunately, it's not easy to just ask, give me all the data for my organism, for human, just give me all, everything that you know about cellular mechanism. Um, because these databases have not really uh, all coordinated, they're standard, they're not standardized. So um, increasingly they are becoming standardized, um, and uh, because of that, tool systems like Pathway Commons, which we, we developed, collect major ones. Um, and, uh, and so this is a good general source for um, Pathway, to see what Pathway databases are kind of active. And in, in it's under, you know, always being developed, so it will become more, more useful over time. But we're going to talk more about specific Pathway databases as well, in particular Reactome later. Um, I mentioned very briefly, I'll mention that there's lots of other annotations. Um, chromosome position. Sometimes you might be interested in getting a lot of information for your genes, whether it's used for pathway analysis or not. Um, and uh, like you might have a list of genes and you want to know the chromosomal locations. Just look them up in a, in a database. Um, a good source for this information is, is uh, the genome browsers or large genome databases. Um, the Two major genome browsers are UCSC Genome Browser, University of California, Santa Cruz, and um, I usually use Ensemble um, because it has a, a really nice search tool called Biomart, um, we can talk about. Entree Gene is really good, and if you're working with a given organism, like a model organism, usually there's a go-to location for, for um, that organism. And if you're interested in others, we can discuss during the lab. Um, I'm not going to go over Biomart too much. But one of the things that I found with using it is it's really hard to kind of understand how it works when you just start using it. But once you figure out the couple of steps that um, are required to get it working, it's, it's very useful. Um, and this just goes through those steps. So when you go to it, um, you need to, and I'm not really going to go through this in too much detail, you can try it out. Um, you can select your uh, ensemble genes, your genome of interest, and then you select your filters, and then you select attributes to download. And, um, if we get time in the lab, you can, um, you can ask questions about it. But you can, when you go to the website just following these steps, you'll probably figure out how it works. Um, okay, so, um, so we've learned about uh, gene lists, pathways, uh, very briefly talked about sources of this information and issues that you might have to deal with. Um, again, some people might have known some of these issues, but now everybody's on the same page with um, with these issues, and, and uh, hopefully you, you learned something as well. Um, so um, there are many attributes, and, and checking out this Biomart system is, is really useful for getting attributes for genes, so you can try it out. Um, okay, so coming back to this, um, this workflow, um, we talked about, um, you know, where the data comes from, assuming uh, normalization is working, talked about your gene list, and the rest of the course is really focused on, you know, the actual methods for, for, for these, two, these two things here. Visualizing and identifying pathways and networks and drilling down to understand molecular mechanism. And then you have to interpret the results to come up with some model explaining your data. Um, and this year I crea we created a, a, a nice workflow that is a lot more detailed than the one that we've had in previous courses. Um, in response to questions that people had. So in the past, we had a workflow that really just focused on the pathway analysis part. And people were kind of always wondering, you know, where their data comes in to the system and how to actually, you know, you know, which path to take. So this, so we, um, so this work, uh, workflow list, tries to list all of the major types of, of data that you have. Um, and if you don't, if there's a data type that you're looking at that um, is not listed here, then you, um, you can let me know. Um, and um, see, me me DNA methylation, for instance, is here. So um, this, these uh, kind of orange, yellow orange boxes here are um, the parts that you have to do to normalize your data and convert it to gene lists. So some, like I mentioned, some uh, experiments just give you gene lists. Right? And so you have your gene list right away. Others require a lot of normalization and scoring and linking your data to genes. Um, but then eventually you get this gene list here. 
um, which is where we kind of start. And one side will be identifying interesting pathways, um, and there's different ways of, of doing that. Um, eventually you'll, you'll find some interesting pathways. And another side is thinking about things in terms of networks, and we'll talk about the difference between pathways and networks later, but all of pathways and networks Pathways and networks, they all tell us some information about cellular mechanism, but there's different ways of representing it. So pathways are just briefly are usually what we understand to be pathways, a, a, a system of steps, series of steps, like a metabolic pathway, whereas networks are just connections between genes that are related. Um, and um, so they don't really tell you as much information as a pathway, but they're still useful for learning about cellular mechanism. So I also, in, um, and so once you've, found interesting pathways and networks, then you, you kind of drill down, focus in on, um, on more uh, specific versions of it, look up genes of interest, um, and, and eventually you're interpreting your results. Um, I, the, we'll, we'll go over all, the, all of these things in the course. The parts, um, the, the tools that we are talking about in the course are highlighted in yellow to kind of help you orient where they are in the big picture of the analysis. So hopefully this will be useful. If you have any feedback, because this is the first time we're using this, um, I, I, it would be useful. Um, OK, so there's also a lab here that uh, we're not going to go over, but you can try yourself um, if you're interested. We don't go over this lab because usually a third to half of us people already know this stuff, so um, anyone else can try it out. Um, so this just gives you some pointers about using um, uh, uh, G profile or using um, the tools that I mentioned. Okay, so I think that um, the coffee break is supposed to start right now, um, but we'll take some questions. Yeah? I'm wondering if you have a list of papers that might have been sort of significantly enhanced or enabled by using these approaches. Um, <coughs> I think people have generate lots of data and they sort of laboriously filter down to a small list, and then we say, okay, well, here's 500 data pieces we can now search and look for stuff. So it would be really interesting Yeah, so that's a great question. What are success stories for how research is being enabled by this? And the autism one is one that I, I mentioned. Um, the other one that I didn't have time to include is a new story where we actually found a drug based on pathway analysis, and that drug seems to be working in a cancer um, with one patient. And it's amazing, amazing story, like that we could, we could do that. Um, people want, we could spend five minutes going over that, but um, um, does anybody want to? Hear that story? Okay. So um, I knew that I wouldn't ex be able to fit it into an hour, but um, so I didn't include it. But I will um, just quickly tell you about it. Um, Okay, so this is, um, I think, a really good success story um, of pathway analysis. Uh, it relates to ependymoma, which is a type of brain tumor. Um, it affects the ependymum. The ependymum is the lining of the brain formed by glial cells. Um, and this is work done in, cl in collaboration with Michael Taylor, who's a neurosurgeon and, and physician scientist at SickKids. Uh, he studies ependymoma in children. Um, it's the third most common type of brain tumor in, ch in children. I'll pass these slides. I'll, I'll make these slides available on the wiki because you don't have them. Um, the um, most common location for in childhood for this tumor is in the posterior fossa, the brainstem and the cerebellum. Um, previously, using gene expression analysis, he noticed that there's two classes of, of ependymoma. Um, one that affects uh, young and the pathologists studying this couldn't, can't really tell the difference between these two, but gene expression is very different, and actually outcome is very different as well. So type A affects the youngest patients and has a terrible prognosis. Type B affects the oldest patients and has an excellent prognosis. Um, so they're actually basically two different diseases as, as, uh, you know, as far as outcome. Um, to look into this further, Michael uh, and collaborators did a lot of exome sequencing and whole genome sequencing to see if they could find mutations that could explain, you know, these differences. And um, strikingly, there were no recurrent mutations, basically, um, especially in this class A. There were some 
copy number aberrations in class B, but the, the serious class A, there was basically no recurrent mutations. It's basically mutationally silent, which is the first time anyone's basically seen that in, in a cancer. Um, cancer tends to have a, people say there's a hallmark mutation genome instability. In this cancer, there is no, does not seem to be genome instability. Um, however, when looking at methylation arrays, CPG, um, I, uh, CPG island DNA, um, DNA CPG island methylation arrays, there was a clear clustering into these two classes. Uh, and so they determined a long list of genes, about 2,000 genes that were differentially methylated. Um, and actually, we, we looked at that. This is um, work by Scott Zyderdine, who's a postdoc in my group. Uh, Steve Mack is the person who led, led the work in Michael's group. Um, and we found that, in general, the, a, the serious A class was very transcriptionally silenced by CB, CPG, island, CPG methylation. Um, so looking at those genes in normal pathway analysis methods um, on the web didn't really find any pathway that was, that was uh, enriched. Uh, nothing came up. So we looked at it. We used a more um, specific, a more appropriate statistical test um, that's useful for rare uh, signals, which, which was the case in this, in this case. And we used a much bigger pathway database uh, that we've collected for our lab, for our use. And I think it's referenced that is also referenced in the assignment. Um, so you'll, you can see that pathway database. Um, and one specific pathway came up really, really strongly. Um, no other pathways. Basically, one pathway was targets of a polycomb repressive complex 2, PRC2, which is a hot topic now. Um, and um, so this was an extremely strong signal in, in this group A. Um, all of these tar uh, uh, SUZ12 and EED and, uh, are, are subunits of this complex. So really it was just this complex seemed to be explaining why these, um, these uh, genes are differentially methylated. Um, and in talking to people in the epigenomics group here, uh, realized that there's, Michael realized that there's a lot of drugs targeting the methyl transferase of PRC2. Um, and uh, they did a lot of experiments to show that these are specifically killing a penomoma. Um, and what's, what's important about that is that a penomoma doesn't have any therapy other than surgery and radiation, which is the worst type of therapy for, um, for, for cancer, um, especially in children. Um, and um, this represents the first mechanism that could be potentially targeted uh, in this disease. Um, and not only that, there are people developing drugs to inhibit this complex. Um, GlaxoSmithKline is developing one. And there's also drugs on the market that generally inhibit DNA methylation. So DNA methylation and also this complex seem to be playing a big role in silencing a bunch of genes that seems to be causing this really serious type of tumor. Um, and a clinical, because there's no known therapy, a clinical trial can be set up very quickly, and so that's being set up. But also, Patient, a patient who's at, at sick kids here who was in very advanced stages of this disease and had a metastasis to their lung uh, was given a method on the market DNA methyl DNA methylation inhibitor um, and in two uh, in the beginning before this in two months this um, this tumor had doubled in size um, and then in three cycles of this DNA methyl methylation inhibitor after actually now f more than five months, the tumor has not grown anymore, and the, the, the kid felt fine, actually, basically, very soon after treating, getting treated with this, this drug. So it, it, at least in one person, there's a, there's a response. It'll take a long time to figure out what the result is, but this is a really great example of how pathway analysis helps make that link between this big list of 2,000 differentially methylated genes that we have no idea what they're doing because we're looking through this list and they have no idea. And searching a big database of information about cellular mechanism, pinpointing this, this, this mechanism and, and, and looking at it. And also, um, because there was only one pathway that came out, um, we were able to track back where this data came from. And um, it came from uh, one of the databases, msigdb, that we pulled in. And we know those people, so we talked to them. And Arthur Lieberzon is the person who's typing in, who typed in this information from a paper that he read in uh, 2005. Had he not done that, we never would have made this link. So there's a real excellent example of how um, you know, having a lot of information, trying to collect as much information as we can about pathways, um, 
can help make discoveries and it motivates us to collect more. So that's, that's you know, there are many, I think there, this is one of the best examples that I know of, um, definitely from, from our work. Um, there are many examples where people use pathway analysis. There are probably 20,000 papers at least that are using pathway analysis at some level, um, just based on citations that I've looked at uh, recently, maybe more than that. Um, whether they're really making it, it, it sort of vital for making that discovery or not is hard to tell. In this case, and in the autism case, the reason I talk about these is because they're really good examples where you needed the pathways, otherwise you would have not made the discoveries.